Welcome back to History Class with Dr. W. We're continuing our discussion of Reconstruction in this lecture. In the previous lectures, we focused primarily on the political processes of Reconstruction. And starting with this lecture, we're going to turn more to the social and cultural aspects of Reconstruction, focusing in this lecture on the impact of the era on the freed slaves, known as the freedmen. In this lecture, we're going to be talking about the process of the, the slaves who were now free, making that transition and adjustment to freedom. And one can only imagine what it might have been like to have spent a lifetime under slavery with all of its restrictions and abuses and horrible aspects, and then suddenly attaining freedom. Many of whom, as the, the individuals in this painting, who may have been well advanced in years beyond their prime working age or the age when one might get an education or launch a career. What is that process going to be like for people like that? So it might be helpful to think first of all about what kinds of things the freedmen would have wanted with their newfound freedom. In other words, what kind of things had been denied to them under all of those years under slavery. And of course there are many, many things, but here are some of the most prominent things that the freedmen sought out in the aftermath of slavery, things that had been denied to them. Well, they wanted to own their own land and their own homes. Obviously, they had always worked under slavery. They had always worked on someone else's land or in someone else's home. They wanted to have a job, really, of their own making and their own liking. And of course one that would have paid them wages as opposed to slavery where they were not paid. Others of them deeply desired to attain an education. And then in many cases they wanted to seek out and reunite with family members who may have been torn apart from them under the abuses of slavery. So these are just some of the kinds of things that the freedmen wanted and over the course of this lecture we're going to talk about a number of these and how successful they were in being able to attain those things in the aftermath of slavery. It's impossible for us now to recreate the emotions and the feelings that must have been going through the freed slaves as they attained their freedom. Surely there was tremendous jubilation and joy that they were now free and no longer slaves. And yet certainly there would have been some trepidation, some concern and hesitation. And the longer they moved forward under freedom, perhaps that trepidation grew deeper, beginning to question, what are we going to do now? Where are we going to go? How are we going to make a living? Where is our next meal going to come from? Where are we going to sleep? All of these kind of questions complicated the process of adjusting to freedom. And the freed slaves certainly played a role in their own fate. There was a tremendous amount of agency and self-determination. We're going to talk about some of those factors uh, over the next few slides. But I want to begin by saying also that the slaves really needed assistance from others as they made the adjustment from slavery to freedom. And in the late stages of the Civil War, the Northern government created the Freedmen's Bureau, which was a part of the Union Army. It was a military operation formed in March of 1865. It was directed by General Oliver O. Howard, who was nicknamed the Christian Soldier. He was tremendously devout and believed deeply in his task to help the freedmen in whatever way he could. Now the Freedmen's Bureau, as it was originally created, was something like the Red Cross or an emergency organization. It was primarily tasked with providing food, clothing, shelter, and medical care for the freed slaves. And it certainly did a great deal of that. But as Howard and the Freedmen's Bureau workers quickly realized, the freed slaves wanted and needed assistance with many other things than just those basic 
uh, initial tasks. Now we'll talk a little bit more later about an overall assessment of the Freedmen's Bureau, but suffice it to say it was tasked with an almost impossible range of tasks. Imagine any organization being called to spread out over the entirety of the South from the farthest reaches of Texas down to the farthest southern reaches of Florida up through the Appalachian Mountains and so on and try to connect with millions of people throughout all of those regions and provide everything they were asking for. They did a lot of great work but there were never enough men, supplies, or material support from the government to get done all of the things they needed to get done. All right, so what kind of things did the Freedmen's Bureau do? Well, first of all, those initial basic tasks, starting with things like food. It distributed millions of rations for both white and black alike throughout the South. It also set up some 40 hospitals around the South to care for the sick and the wounded, and even with inoculations. But the Freedmen soon began approaching Freedmen's Bureau agents with other requests. Can you help me locate family members, for instance? And the Freedmen's Bureau was one of only a few, and maybe the only, organization that was situated to perhaps help out with those kind of requests, because there were Freedmen's Bureau agents in every state in the South and scattered throughout the region. So they could undertake this idea of trying to track down lost family members. But it was an incredibly daunting task. If you take a moment and look at these kinds of advertisements, which were very common in that region, you get a sense of how difficult it might have been to track down slaves that had been relocated, sent to other plantations, and sold. Uh, as you look in these advertisements, you see, I, I learned some six years ago that he was on a steamboat running between Memphis and New Orleans, and so on. Just these little bits of information, sometimes from years earlier. As you can imagine, those reunions were difficult to achieve. Sometimes the family members couldn't be found. Other times you would find out that they had passed away at some point. And in other cases, as with husbands trying to seek out wives or wives trying to seek out husbands, you might come to find that as the years passed, those people moved on and created new relationships and new families. And so sometimes there was heartbreak linked to these reunions. The freedmen also needed assistance in dealing with the law. And in this case, this really means protection from the law. Those southern black codes that were designed to keep blacks held down in so many different ways. And so the Freedmen's Bureau intervened in many cases when it could and tried to protect the freedmen from local law officials. And as I mentioned, the military ultimately was tasked with overseeing trials in some cases in the South. The Freedmen's Bureau also played a role in assisting freedmen with things like labor and land. Howard and his men discouraged idleness and despised idleness in the freedmen. But the former slaves had few options. They had little training uh, in anything beyond farming or the household tasks they had been doing up to that point. And there weren't a whole lot of labor opportunities at that time in the South. And so ultimately, much of the South arrived at the sharecropping system. This was a system where in many cases, the former slaves, not always, but many cases, former slaves continued to live and work on the same land that they had been working on, only now not as slaves. They would grow the crops and harvest the crops, and then at the end of each season, they would share the crops with the landowners. Now, this system was created out of necessity. It's a way for all sides to get done what needed to be done without paying wages. On the other hand, it was subject to all kinds of abuses, primarily because the white landowners who oversaw the process had the knowledge and the education 
of what was going on. And so when the crops were distributed and shared, it was the white landowners who were always tabulating things and making a determination of who got what. So sharecropping was a sort of necessary system for a time, but also subject to great abuses. It should be noted that while most of the freed slaves did wind up as sharecroppers, at least for a time, not all of them did. There were others who found work as house servants, fishermen, carpenters, bankers, mechanics, cigar makers, dressmakers, and even some who arose in professions like teaching or the law or politics. But again, the, the great majority uh, wound up as sharecroppers. On a similar note, most freedmen in the aftermath of slavery were not able to purchase land of their own, even with the assistance of the Freedmen's Bureau, although they did help. Now, I mentioned in the aftermath of the Civil War, as Sherman marched to the South, under his special field order number 15, land was distributed to the freedmen. But in 1865, May of 1865, an act called the Amnesty Act restored those lands to their original owners, and the freedmen were dispossessed of that land. There were other efforts to help the freedmen obtain land of their own. In June 1866, the Southern Homestead Act opened up some government lands for settlement at $5 for 40 acres. The Freedmen's Bureau assisted in helping survey the land and transporting freedmen to it. But only a small number or a small percentage of freedmen were able to make this purchase because so few of them had any money at all. And in many cases, the land that they purchased was not of the highest quality. There were others who attempted to help in this regard as well. The American Missionary Association came into the South and pooled their resources, purchasing several small plantations or other plots of land to sell to the freedmen themselves. However, this relatively small organization was only able to help a relatively few families with this process. And so again, most of the freedmen in this era found themselves living and working on the same lands they had been on before through the process of sharecropping. 